Thanks to everyone at the NID for inviting me. Honor, pleasure, everything. So, uh, the word has gotten truncated. It's called, the word is Fluxinisi Helifilification, uh, which is one of the longer words in the OED, which essentially means something of little or no value. Uh, this is, yeah. Uh, and we'll, as we progress through the presentation, we'll speak a bit more about the footnote and the marginalia. Uh, so yeah, so what am I going to speak about? I, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, and as I was going through the TED uh, specifications, uh, you know, there was a thing that, you know, it has to be entertaining. It's right there in the, in the core branding, you know, TED. And, uh, and I was looking at TED and I, of course, felt like erasing the E. So it becomes TD. And then if you invert this, it becomes DT, differential of T. And then if you integrate it, then you get a big T. Uh, which is, you know, time t on a long, slow, absorptive crawl, you know, not entertaining and perhaps even David boring. You know, what is David doing there? But that's just a little uh, nod of the hat to my favorite graphic novelist. novelist. I will not get into it here. Uh, okay, so this is red on red. Uh, so I feel a little uh, odd here, kind of being, uh, talking about art. Uh, uh, Changing, innovation, nothing of that, useless stuff. Uh, so I typically try to uh, borrow a term from physics, uh, the notion of the thought experiment. Uh, uh, you know, something which is completely unspectacular. I mean, it, it, it is no really great big machines crunching stuff. But essentially as a kind of, you know, speculative thinking, trying to figure out an essential an experiment which happens immaterially. I, mean, I would rather not make objects, but sometimes I do have to make prints and videos, and yeah, I would rather ideally like not to fill up the world with objects. I mean, there are enough anyway. And yeah, and art also gives me a space to operate outside of the, you know, what I kind of try to call it the accessibility bogeyman. Will it be accessible? Will, will, will the masses get it? So, uh, on the thought experiment bit, um, consider this. What if I woke up tomorrow to find the landscape outside my house turned into a mathematical dreamland of a Riemann zeta function? How will the Doppler effect of noisy autos traversing this landscape actually sound? Now, of course, I'm completely, you know, my math chops are zero. But, and I won't even try to uh, explain what a Riemann zeta landscape is. But essentially it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a real but, you know, mathematical landscape full of interesting topographical features and possibilities. So, you know, imagine, imagine you being physically there and Doppler effect, of course, you know, as many of you would know, is this particular, you know, sound phenomena of the, uh, the way the sound, the frequency changes as a, you know, sound generating source moves away from you, right? So, you know, imagine this noisy auto traversing this complex terrain and it trying to kind of maneuver this complex terrain. It's maneuvering uh, trajectories being guided by the complexity of the terrain and how will the sound uh, reach back to you? You know, what will happen from such a speculative exercise? I have no idea. But I did a work recently based on such thinking. Uh, I won't bore you with the final, you know, kind of details on this. It's online. You can, you know, if you're interested, you can go and have a look. It was part of a larger uh, show, kind of on, you know, net curated show by Meena Bari from Srishti and Seema, along with Chris Ab at the London College of Art. Uh, so um, what I'll try to do. Uh, now, in the remaining time that I have, is I'll try to uh, kind of explore how this notion of oscillation uh, kind of resurfaces in my work, and this is an idea that I've been kind of, you know, uh, obsessed with and, you know, 
t is equal to 2 pi root over l by g, you know, such a lovely equation, you know, Fourier transform, decomposing a complex wave form into constituent sine wave. And sine wave and sine wave function is also that obsesses me, and I've done another work on it, but I won't get into it now. It's kind of available online, you can go and have a look. So, yeah. Uh, exploring the idea of oscillation across three works and show a small kind of image and text micro narrative, what I call you know, image and text here, yeah, small narrative table. And then uh, I'll kind of show you uh, 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 a chemical cycle. I will come to it when we and and, uh, and another recent work. So. Uh, this work that I'm going to show you was is part of a larger work called Some Fables on the Unstable Oscillation of Uniformity. It was shown at, uh, at a gallery here, Gallery Ski in Bangalore in 2006, and then been part of multiple group shows uh, in various parts. Uh, this is the kind of video projection, how it was installed. There's also a sound, uh, sound piece that went along, I won't get into that. So, oscillation. The painter suffers a car crash. The experience gives rise to a painting. The painting eventually lands up in a hotel. Inspired by the painting, the master chef in the hotel's boutique restaurant, Reality Onion. Savoring the subtle taste of Reality Onion, the choreographer starts to visualize the initial movements for May's, her new performance. And yet, in another round of inspiration, the movements of May's spur the monsieur to knead the flesh into ecstatic folds. I'll come back to the narrative after I kind of go through the two other works and just try to perhaps annotate it a bit, marginalia. Uh, I'll move on to the other instance of oscillation. Uh, this is again a hypothetical, but completely within the bounds of uh, possibility. It can be actually realized in a lab, and you know, if I have enough, uh, whatever, lab resources, I can, you know, I can set it up. But uh, so it's not just a random uh, equations cooked up. So this was, I mean, essentially what I'm, it's the print. I'm going to show you a detail of that. This is how it was. Installed it. This is in a group show in Bombay. Okay, I know the, the 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 text is not immediately readable, but essentially what's happening here, I will overlay the annotation. So I call this the Cantor Dust cycle. Cantor Dust is a kind of my whatever online moniker. These T-shirts I call them Cantor Dust conjecture T-shirts. Anyway, so essentially what is happening here is uh, you have benzene on. Uh, the organic compound uh, on the two poles, right? On the right side of the circle is what I call the aromatic cycle, and the left side is the aliphatic. So, aromatic are basically you know organic compounds which have the benzene ring in them, and aliphatic do not. So, on the and it's each step is a transformation. So, you start with benzene, you treat it with concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid and at 60 degrees centigrade and a nitro group gets fixed on and you get nitrobenzene. Uh, then you heat it with, uh, treat it with tin and hydrochloric acid, you get aniline. So a series of transformation uh, steps, one across the other. But essentially, it's a kind of topological snake biting its own tail kind of uh, maneuver because essentially at the end of the pole you get back to benzene. But the intermediary steps are all, you know, they are all have the, still the benzene ring in them. So it's a kind of, you know, benzene eating its own tail, but still retaining its, you know, whatever, aromatic identity. And this other half is again benzene eating its own tail, but 
uh, in a aliphatic identity which is taken off its you know its organic aromatic cell and these are all again series of transformations which uh, are are non non uh, aromatic compounds you know from ethylene glycol to acetaldehyde to ethylene to ethyl chloride to ethylene to ethylene uh, ethylene dibromide to acetylene to back to benzene so again again you start with an organic it has the benzene ring it you go through a series of transformations does not have the benzene ring and again back to the node one you have the ring back again so again kind of you know continuous transformation so change repetition thresholds of you know thresholds of identity when does one entity or identity change into one another what is the you know uh, what are the kind of limits or gray zones of transformation uh, you know there can be multiple parsings and riffs from it okay i will uh, i'll quickly rush through the last one which is uh, which was a work done over the last uh, year 2010 to 2011 it's called essentially a thousand proteins bloom and uh, essentially this was uh, developed at uh, uh, a bioarts residency at symbiotica so thanks to our own cats and Yonat Zul there, uh, uh, very supportive, uh, and was exhibited at the Science Gallery at the Trinity College. So um, I'll perhaps, uh, you know, there's a small narrative which kind of anchors it. Uh, consider a rogue nation state X. Since X is a rogue state, it is suffering from a crippling trade embargo. Although excess supplies have been cut off, it still wants to wreak havoc on the world through nasty explosions. The dedicated scientists of X have recently discovered a method to extract ammonia from human breast milk. This new method liberates X from heavy industrial methods for ammonia production and transforms the mother's body into an ammonia farm. X therefore calls upon its patriotic lactating mothers to contribute their milk for the explosive production effort of this nation state, of the rogue nation state. The patriotic mothers of X queue up in front of a milk collection booth and wait patiently for their turn to express milk. I'll cut through this. Uh, essentially, I was looking at the kind of history of, of you know, the born have a cycle and the history of ammonia production. It's kind of strange intersection with chemical warfare. I won't get into that. You know, uh, so when I was in Zimbabwe in Australia, I was trying to you know, explore a bunch of ways to, you know, how to kind of actually get ammonia from human breast milk. Uh, I tried out, uh, you know, whole, whole various kinds of things. You know, not exactly rocket science, as you can see. Uh, but it didn't yield enough ammonia in an appreciable quantity to kind of even demonstrate, okay, I have got ammonia from, you know, X liters of breast milk. I was trying to kind of test using copper sulfate and it was not turning the shade of dark blue that I wanted it to. Uh, I'll run fast through this. But, so, you know, after I came back from there, the problem stayed with me and I was trying to see, you know, how could I, how could I solve this? And then, uh, beer. I mean, I'm not a drinker, but you know, it's a lovely yellow shade. And uh, I chanced across this very old, uh, you know, standard organic chemistry analytical method to do nitrogen estimation in organic compounds called the Geldel method. Uh, so this is what basically, you know, the Geldel method does. You know, it, uh, it uh, traps the nitrogen and organic compound into ammonia and it does a quantitative uh, weight estimation of the uh, ammonia and that's how it kind of figures out how much, of, how much nitrogen could have been there in the parent organic compound. Uh, so this, it goes through a long process called like almost eight hours digestion process and after this digestion process this, you know, this opaque milk turns into this lovely translucent, you know, uh, white uh, blue fluid and from this if you just treat it with some alkali uh, and then uh, ammonia gets generated because Nestle's reagent is the classic test for testing ammonia because it can detect ammonia in very minute micromolar quantities. So there you have, you know, brown Nestle's reagent. But unfortunately, you know, when I tried to kind of replicate that in Dublin, you know, that I didn't get enough lab time, you know, eight hours of distillation, it didn't work. But you know, I staged it as a kind of failed experiment, and you know, the failure is so alluring, you know. It's, uh, this is, you know, somehow how it was kind of set up. And, uh, yeah.